So thanks for the invitation. And today I'll be talking about primes of the form P squared plus NQ squared. And everything I'm discussing today is joint work with Ben Green, who I think is in the audience. Um, great. So, so I guess maybe the starting point here. So Fermat conjectured and Euler proved um, uh, that a prime can be written as a sum of two squares. Um, It's the sum of two integer squares if and only if p is congruent to one mod four. And for Fermat also considered sort of whether uh, primes could be represented as other as sums of related quadratic forms. So whether a prime could be written as x squared plus two y squared or x squared plus three y squared. Um, and he sort of conjectured conditions based on p lying its own residue classes. Um, I think these were these were eventually proven by I think Euler and Legendre, but okay. And in general, sort of understanding when a prime period and the sum of x squared plus n y squared motivated a lot of results in algebraic number theory. There's um, this book. Uh, primes of the form uh, x squared plus n y squared uh, by Cox, which sort of is obviously inspiring the title of the paper. So what we'll be considering is sort of, can you still produce primes where you sort of specialize uh, these variables beyond just being integers? Um, and sort of there have been numerous results uh, so there have been many results considering um, when one specializes uh, one of the variables. So for each of this, these results, the result is um, there are infinitely many primes of the form So the first result along these lines was due to uh, Fouvry and Avanit. So they proved that there are infinitely many primes and gave an asymptotic for um, where the prime is of the form x squared plus p squared. So the second coordinate is the square of a prime. So this was proven by uh, Fouvry and Ivanich. Yeah. Um, there was then celebrated work of Friedlander and Ivanich considering primes of the form x squared plus y to the fourth. So um, this was the first uh, polynomial, which sort of, so this, had, this takes on, um, sort of they're only n to the three quarters numbers less than uh, n, which can be represented in the form. And this was the first polynomial, which sort of takes a, a sort of a polynomially thin set of values that was shown to capture primes. Um, this was refined in work of uh, Heath, Brown, and Lee to sort of, instead of requiring just the, cor the second coordinate as a square, it's actually a square of a prime. So this was proven by Heath, Brown, and Lee. So this is a, a fact, not an extensive summary of the results. It's a subset. Um, there was then work of Pratt, which so you could take it to be x squared plus l squared, at where l is missing three specified digits, uh, three digit three digits in its decimal expansion. So you so you fix three digits, say like one seven nine. And you require that L um, not contain those three digits in its decimal expansion. So this was shown by Pratt. And um, finally, the very pretty result of Marikovsky, Marikovsky, where he shows x squared plus L squared, where L can be taken from a set S, which is sort of polynomially sparse. So 
the intersection of S with the first n integers is, um, he just needs that it's not too small. So let's say bigger than n to the point nine 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 nine. He doesn't actually produce a constant, but his methods clearly can give, can produce an explicit one. So this is Bratkowski 26. So, so these all specialize. Uh, the second coordinate y to live in a special set. So the focus of the talk will sort of be on what can you say when you sort of force uh, x and y to live, um, both x and y to live in special sets. So. So the motivation of our work uh, came from this paper, Friedlander to Boniich, where they were able to show some results in this direction. So they were able to prove that x squared plus four y squared uh, is, is infinitely often prime uh, with x being prime and y having less than or equal to seven prime factors. And um, there's this four here. So you need, uh, so you can't just have x squared plus y squared being prime with x and y being prime unless one of the numbers is even for parity reasons and sort of, let's say, well beyond modern technology, something like x squared plus four has prime values, uh, is prime infinitely often. So um, yeah, so that's what this explains the presence of this constant four. So our main result is sort of, uh, sort of improving uh, the work of Friedlander or Boniich to instead of requiring y to have at most seven prime factors to being able to prove that y can be taken to be prime. Um, so as mentioned before, this is joint work with Ben Green. So let n be congruent to zero or four mod six. So this condition just arrives, so the condition mod two arises for parity reasons, the condition mod three arises for mod three conditions, and we'll be studying um, positive definite forms. Uh, then we have an asymptotic for uh, sort of the number of representations where uh, uh, x squared plus ny squared is prime, where x and y are also prime. So this is pi times kappa n times x over square root n plus o of x times log log x squared over log x. So we're winning about one logarithm for the trivial bound. And kappa n is some uh, conditionally convergent series. Uh, so I'm being a little bit, I'm being a little bit sloppy with how I write it, just but interpret it so that it makes sense. Um, and this sort of has the expected form. There's the pi is coming from some Archimedean considerations and these are just coming from the uh, considerations mod p. And uh, as is usual, lambda x is the von Mangold function. So this is log x um, if x is, e is a prime power and zero otherwise. Um, also, just for convenience, uh, we're also just going to, I'm just going to have the von Mangle function if it's negative of a prime power just be the same value. Um, this is this is just for convenience. So in particular, when n is equal to four, um, uh, this resolves um, so this resolves a conjecture of Friedlander Ivanich, which they gave the very pretty name uh, the Gaussian prime conjecture.
So, um, so, so for the remainder of the talk, um, so. Uh, I will specialize to n equals four, j just so that we're always working over the ring of integers and we have unique factorization and things are a little bit nicer. Um, and the hope of the rest of the talk is to give some summary of the ideas going into the proof. Um, um, if there are any questions, now is probably a good time. Otherwise, I'll sort of proceed towards the proof. No question, but congratulations. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the remark by Trevor in the comments, uh, log P instead of log A. Ah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Great. Uh, Okay, so for convenience, it'll be useful to define the following. Uh, so what I'll need is sort of the rough model of the primes. So this is, I'll take the primes less than some cutoff Q. Um, the P over P minus one is just a normalization factor. And uh, I'll take the indicator that X is uh, co-prime to P. And Q here will be some slightly technical thing. Um, please ignore this. It's just some quasi polynomial cutoff. So just think of it like a SIF weight. Or this is like a rough model for the primes. Okay. So the proof breaks into two steps. Um, the first is evaluating the main term. So you need to evaluate this lambda Q of X, lambda Q of Y. Um, the indicator that X squared plus four Y squared is prime. And this equals whatever the main term is supposed to be. So, um, so this can be accomplished. Uh, Sorry, can you change your small x into capital X? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. This is a capital X. Probably, yeah. Okay. I will not attempt to change the variables in my notes, but that was an unfortunate choice. Um, yeah. So this this can be accomplished via um, the methods of multiplicative number theory. So you don't um, the more classical um, the it's not entirely straightforward. So then the real focus is sort of showing that um, that this guess where you take the rough model of the primes is somewhat accurate. So you have x squared plus 4y squared less than capital X and x squared plus 4y squared is prime, you need to show that uh, lambda x, lambda y, this lambda qx, this lambda qy, you need to show that this difference is a little of the main term. So a trivial bound is something like x over log x, um, but okay, we're going to say something like one power of log over the trivial bound. And so the focus of the rest of the talk will be sort of on establishing um, two. Okay. Um, and for reasons that will become clear, we sort of want our weights to sort of factorize based on the real part and the imaginary. Well, first let me do the manipulation and then say what I was about to say. Okay. So, so we, so we telescope the above sum. Um,
And okay, so um, so notice now that we sort of have we've just decomposed this is an element of identity. We've now decomposed into two parts where sort of uh, the weight we're considering sort of factors as a function of x and a function of y. So it becomes natural to sort of so maybe the name Gaussian prime suggests Gaussian prime conjecture suggests it's sort of natural to work over um, z adjoint i. So we'll define a weight on um, the integers x plus y i to be, we'll just be considering for much of the talk, it's sort of, it's instructive to sort of, instead of considering the specific weights at hand to just say we have some weight um, on the Gaussian integer, which sort of factors as a function of the real part and the imaginary part. So just two functions, f of x, uh, f of x and g of y. And what we're going to be focused on is sort of uh, as written, this is hopelessly vague, but let's say, um, I'll try to explain what I mean. So we're trying to understand when like weights of this form, um, so we're summing uh, X plus Y over uh, Gaussian primes. Um, and you have that, um, uh, uh, okay. uh, you're, you're sort of summing over Gaussian primes and you have that the norm is small, less than some capital X. So the game is sort of to understand when this is small. Um, I haven't done anything, but just rewrite this. So, so this is a sum over, over Gaussian primes. Um, and we attack this sort of in the standard way, we attack this by a, by establishing the appropriate type one and type two information. And just sort of to orient ourselves, since we're we're doing our sitting over the Gaussian primes just so that we just so we have some terminology. So type one at level L, or so this will just be we have um we have some Gaussian integer and we have that its norm squared is roughly L. This turns out to be how you should normalize. Um and you just sum over things divisible by this Gaussian integer. Sort of all my weights will be sort of supported on objects with norm at most uh, root x, so sort of under this constraint. So the trivial bound will be something like x. And we say we have type 1 information if we can sort of beat the trivial bound by some large power of the one. So 1,000 is unimportant. It's just some fixed cost, some sufficiently large fixed constant. and Type two at level L will be um, you sum over uh, integers A, B, uh, Gaussian integers A, B, and you say A is roughly of size L. Um, you have two sequences, alpha A, beta B, um, the weight at A, B, you sort of save the trivial bound by some large power of log here as well. And two. of course, it's crucial to step. Um, type two. What? Ah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. OK, great. Um, OK, so what we, so the proof will essentially establish uh, type one at um, x to the one half minus some large power of log 
and uh, type two at um, x to the one half minus some some little a one, and so then um, so results of uh, Duke Friedlander Novaniage. Um, Do that. What? Okay, sorry. So results of Duke Friedlander Novaniage and Okay, there's a slight technicality since we don't get type one all the way up to x to one half. You'll need an upper bound sieve. Or sufficient to establish. Um, the necessary the fact that the sum over the sum over the Gaussian primes is small. But this is a little of and this is a comment. So we have an so this result of Duke Friedland and Ravani, so what it says um, is that if you have type one information at a half and type two information at a third, then that's sufficient to produce primes. Um, so we sort of have enough, we have more than enough type two information, sort of the, the reason we're not getting sort of an arbitrary power of log is sort of type one information. Um, um, so, so really the focus of the talk um, will be on getting, so maybe the approach at some broad level is sort of treat the von Mangle function as essentially a completely arbitrary function and sort of understand conditions under which the type one or type two sum instead of being small is large and then verify that that condition is not satisfied for the von Mangle function. So the focus on the, the focus of the talk will be on getting like verifiable conditions under which The type one and type two sums are small. Okay. Um, okay. So, sort of the maybe the key um, key point in the paper is that these verifiable conditions we will establish will come from sort of Gower's norms. So for this, I need to um, say what define Gower's norms. So just consider an arbitrary function f from the integers to the complex numbers. Um, the Gower's UK norm, so I have a scale axis technical thing. Um, we'll define it as x to the minus k plus one times the sum over x h1 hk um, delta h1 delta hk of f of x. And here, delta h of f of x, this is f of x times f of x plus h bar. Um, so this definition always seems, it's rather compact, but maybe it's difficult to parse at first. So just, just to write it out explicitly, the U2 norm is X cubed, or X to the minus three times the sum over X, H1, H2, F of X, F of X plus H1 bar F of X plus H2 bar, f of x plus h1 plus h2. And this is the same thing as um, sort of in this case, you should think of the u2 norm as sort of being something like uh, 
information about the Fourier coefficients of your sequence. Um, so it's the L4 norm of the Fourier transform. So the way I've normalized everything, sort of if I'm taking a UK norm at scale X, that means my function sort of lives between minus X and X. Um, and, and I've normalized it so that the maximum of a function, which is supported between minus X and X, it's the largest value UK norm can be is uh, some constant. So you can ask when say the U2 norm of X, this is bigger than Delta, um, this corresponds to sort of this, but this identity plus Planterell sort of tells you F has a large Fourier coefficient. And in general, um, sort of uh, higher Gower's norms, and when they are large, um, is the subject of higher order for analysis. So I, I won't need too much, but no, that's playing some role here. So the two key claims are sort of establishing that the appropriate type one and type two sums are controlled by um, Gower's norms. So claim one, okay. So I need that a certain parameter L, this is less than X to the one half. And I have functions, um, so functions F and G, uh, which are in plus minus X to the one half. And okay, um, the way I'll write the claims F and G will be one bounded. In our application, they're bounded by log, but it's sort of a minor point. So what we'll have is that the type one sum, so, so I'm sort of parameterizing everything in coordinates, so Okay, just to recall, so the type one sum is you're looking at Gaussian integers where the norm is of a certain size. So instead you can just sort of say that the coordinates are of an appropriate size. Um, so you sum on the outside over AB and you take the absolute value, the sum over XY on the inside, F of AX minus BY times G of BX plus AY. So the trivial, um, the trivial upper bound for this is X. Suppose that this is Delta times the trivial bound. Um, the key claim will be that um, the U3 norm, so in this case, you can also take the U2 norm, but okay. the U3 norm here is bigger than Delta over log X to the O1. Um, and maybe just to make sure that we're all on the same page, the reason this precise form is coming up is that A times BI uh, times X plus YI, this is AX minus BY plus um, BX plus AY times I. So we're sort of crucially using here that the, the weights we're looking at, they sort of factor as a function of the real part and the imaginary part and then we're saying that if the type one sum is large, then you know that, um, let's say that the function on the real part has large U3 norm. Um, so the same claim also holds for, uh, for the function, function G. Um, Of the second claim is sort of the analogous claim for type two. So here you want L to be less than X to the point four nine nine. And okay, I'll have four functions and we'll suppose that the support of each of them is between, uh, is between X to plus minus a half. And I, I realize I hadn't clarified this. This is just the set of integers from minus X to the half all the way to X to the one half. 
Um, and we'll also suppose that they're all one bounded. So, so okay, um, here it's more convenient to sort of just apply Cauchy-Schwartz and remove the weights alpha and beta, and then you get um, then you get a sum which looks like this. So I'm summing over a b a prime b prime of size l to the one half on the outside, and then x y on the inside. So you have f one of a x minus b y, f two of b x plus a y, f three of a x prime minus uh, ah sorry. A prime x minus b prime y f four of b prime x plus a prime y. Okay. Suppose that this is bigger than delta times x times l. So if you just work it out, x times l is the trivial bound here. So you're at least delta times the trivial bound. Then there exists some integer t bigger than one, um, such that you have this claim for all the functions that the u t norm at x to the one half is bigger than uh, delta over log x um, to the O1. OK. Um, maybe the first remark here which sort of gives away something slightly strange is happening. Um, so this Gower's norm here, it's kind of absurdly large, something like at least 10 to the 100, probably larger. but. That's a that's a safe lower bound for what's happening, and okay, um, and also slightly completely disingenuous thing is this is ultimately proven by Cauchy Schwartz, but um, as we'll discuss, sort of there's something hiding here. Okay, um, and so then, so one then has to ask why is this useful or what's this finish. Um, so why is this sufficient? Um, so this is due to sort of more recent work of James Lang. Um, from earlier this year. So what we have is that the von Mengel function minus its rough model uh, uh, we just normalize the scale. So I sort of cut it off between some scale. The UK norm of this is smaller than any power of logarithm. Okay, so a couple of remarks are in order. So um, k equals two here. So as I mentioned earlier, one should think of the U2 norm as sort of corresponding to Fourier information. I mean, so the k equals two cases, this is work of Vinogradov, essentially. And, and sort of this is not the first result in this line. So uh, green and tau, uh roughly gave uh uh gave a result uh with uh little o one um this was improved in work of uh Tao and Terry Vinen. Um uh they proved say some saving of a double power of log. And notice that for application, we really need um, to save a large power of log. And the reason this is possible is, uh, so recent improved bounds, on the Gower's inverse theorem. Uh, 
So this is due to James, Lang, Washman Sun, myself, um, are, are, are used to prove this. So in particular, um, so uh, this builds on earlier work. of Greentown and Ziegler. Um, so their bounds were ineffective and hence this little one and improves on work of manners. Um, um, and sort of, sort of, there's some correspondence between the improvements to the inverse theorem and the bounds you get on the Gower's uniformity. Okay, so so maybe so what I'll try to do is sort of so in general when one is establishing results correspond sort of showing that um, okay so Gower's norms originally arose sort of to understand linear equations um, so Gower's introduced. Uh, Introduce these norms in the study of k term arithmetic uh, of k term arithmetic progressions. This was the starting point of his um, very well known work on uh, bounds for Samaritan theorem. So. Let me sort of start by sort of this is the starting point of his work. So I have a function from the integers to the complex numbers where the support of f is inside plus minus x, and the L infinity norm of x is bounded by one. And okay, so a natural thing to try to understand when you're studying, say, three term arithmetic progressions is sort of the weighted count of three term arithmetic progressions uh, weighted by f. Suppose this is at least delta times x squared. So the trivial upper bound due to the Allen-Fendi bound is x squared. Then one has that the u2 norm at scale x is larger than some power of delta. So this claim can be proven by taking a Fourier transform, but um, an important idea is sort of one can also prove these things just by doing the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and this will be crucial. So um, I'll sort of step through this calculation because it's instructive. Um, so if you just if you just pull out the variable f. What you'll find is um, you can sort of pull out the variable f, and you sort of have that delta x squared is less than um, the following sum. You can then do Cauchy Schwartz and find that that this is bounded by. The following and so this is roughly x and okay so this gives delta x cubed is less than so okay there's a square I can expand out the square and change variables um, if you do this you get x d1 d2 f of x plus d1, f bar of x plus d2, f of x plus 2d1, f of x bar, x plus 2d2. Um, and OK, one can change variables. And one does it carefully. One gets something like delta h of f of x, delta h 
delta 2h of f of x plus d. Um, and sort of, okay, this, this, this Cauchy-Schwartz, and then you see this multiplicative derivative maybe explains part of the definition. One does Cauchy-Schwartz one more time. So delta of fourth x to the sixth. So this will be bounded by, um, this will be bounded by the following. So you take x and h to be bounded by, uh, by less than x. Um, sum over d delta 2h f of x plus d. So here I've just I've just done Cauchy-Schwartz again and pulled out the variables x and h. Um, and okay, if one rearranges enough, um, one gets the delta to the fourth times x cubed. I've been losing implicit constants everywhere, but. So, yeah, um, one gets that this is, and changes variables as we did before, this is exactly saying that the following sum is large, delta h1, delta 2h2, f of x. And okay, um, so this is not exactly the definition of the Gower's norm. There's this annoying constant too, but it's it can be removed relatively easily. This gives that the U2 norm of F is bigger than some constant times delta. So we've done this by some number. So we've taken our original um, expression, which is sort of this kind of multilinear average. Uh, you're evaluating this function F at X, X plus D, X plus 2D, and you've converted it into sort of understanding that this norm is large. Um, so the one thing here that's maybe, so it turns out um, it's now understood due to several works of Gowers and then Green and Tau, sort of that if you have, a, you have a set of linear forms which has bounded coefficients, then you can sort of repeat this procedure and say that your average is controlled by um, some Gowers norm. Um, so maybe the strange thing is, so, uh, maybe for the type one and type two sums though, um, we have growing coefficients. Um, so at the start, this seems sort of Seems scary, but okay. Um, so if you tried using Cauchy-Schwartz like this, so you can do after many applications of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. What you can do is you can sort of observe something like the following happens. So you have a type two sum so the type two sum being large, you can convert it to some kind of strange expression being large. So I'll just write it out just to sort of show what I mean. So this is a slight lie, or, or actually there are several lies here, but I think it's kind of representative of what's happening. Um, it isn't so important. This is just delta to the O1 times the trivial upper bound. Um, okay. So, okay, this sort of looks like a Gower's norm, but it doesn't actually look like a Gower's norm. Um, so maybe for comparison, something to keep in mind is what does the Gower's U3 norm look like? Um, so this is x at scale h to the one. 
Um, so I my functions here all support on the scale x to one half because that's what appears in our type one sum, uh, type one and type two sums. You have some expression like this instead. Um, and the trivial bound here is say delta x squared. So the strange thing that's happened here is that these differences. Um, are coupled in a strange way. And maybe the, the main punchline is that we now have tools, so, so tools called concatenation theorems, which convert um, these complicated differences into standard Gower's norms. So the first work in this direction was due to Tau and Ziegler, um, and their their application actually was counting polynomial progressions in the primes. However, their work was in some sense decidedly qualitative, um, and it's, it's sort of important for what we're doing that we have quantitative results. So the first quantitative results here um, they were first due to Poos and Prendeville. So they use this to establish bounds on uh, the following special case of the polynomial Samaretti theorem. So you're looking at a set of one through n, which has no patterns of form x, x plus y, x plus y squared. And then is 20, um, plus 21. So uh, plus, So instead of just considering this three-term pattern, Plus was able to consider sort of any case of the polynomial Samaretti theorem where the polynomials are distinct degree. So maybe an indicative example is something like this. And um, so we rely on um, even more uh, like sort of recent variants of these results. And it's actually crucial. So um, so there's a result of KUKA and then even more recently uh, work of uh, Kravitz, KUKA, Lang. So they have some incredibly general results about um, um, uh, on, on concatenation. Um, sort of, this is sort of a very complicated set of differencing parameters and they have sort of very abstract arguments which allow you to convert these very sort of strange looking Gower storms into at the cost of sort of increasing the 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 parameter in the Gower's norm. So instead of this won't be controlled by the U3 norm, but it will be controlled by some large Gower's norm. And that's sufficient for our understanding. Um, and that's all I actually had planned to say. So um, thank you. <laughs>